My name is Suzanne Hopf. I'm the directing attorney for the Kentucky Innocence Project with the Department of Public Advocacy. And we teach an externship at all three law schools. Um, it's a one-year externship over the fall and the spring. And NKU's externship is taught at Fridays um, from 10 a.m. to noon. And we meet about 10 times per semester. Um, so we don't meet every week. Um, some externships do a one week on, one week off schedule. Ours is not quite that consistent uh, because I have things I have to attend to um, around the state of Kentucky and also conferences I have to go to and meetings I have to go to. So we set our schedule up around my schedule at the beginning of every semester. Um, but we do give out a syllabus at the beginning of the semester so that everybody has an idea of what dates that they're expected to come to class. We teach the externship at the law schools. We're a little different um, as uh, compared to other externships because most externships are very locally based and we're not local. Um, our main office is in Frankfurt. So what we do is we come to the law schools and we basically hold shop for two hours um, every other week at the law schools. And then we also have a couple of um, afternoon, like a few offsite events that I'll explain a little bit later. Uh, and so what we do is because we're the Kentucky Innocence Project, we are looking for people who have been wrongly convicted. And uh, they're people who have claims that would revolve around an innocence claim, a claim of innocence, somebody who's serving time in prison or possibly is on the sex offender registry. Um, or possibly is out on parole. But the point is that you're working on real cases. Um, we don't set anything up as a case problem, which, you know, which is like a fabricated problem. Um, our cases can be a little bit messy just because they are real cases and there are just not perfect cases out there. Uh, we choose the cases to teach at the law schools and to have you work at the law schools based on our belief that there's the potential of an innocence claim. So you're working on real cases, you have real clients, and you get to work with attorneys, you get to work with not only the attorneys that are in the wrongful conviction or the Kentucky Innocence Project unit, um, but also trial. Sometimes you connect with the trial attorneys that work the case. Sometimes you work with appellate attorneys and sit down and have meetings and interviews with them. And there are occasional cases where there have been also other post-trials, post-conviction attorneys that have worked on the cases. Um, if we have the ability to get you into prisons and have you meet the clients, we have you do that as well. It can be a little bit problematic for the law schools because um, not only is Kentucky Innocence Project, the staff based out of Frankfurt, but our clients are all over the state of Kentucky. And so depending on who, who, um, what clients, what cases are at what facilities, it could require a full day of travel. Um, in years past, we have required our students to meet all their clients. And as we're moving forward, I think we're going to, it's going to be more of an elective basis. Um, if you feel like you can take the time to go meet clients and talk to them, we think it's really positive. We think you should be, we want you to come to the prisons with us and talk to the clients. If it's possible, um, we have clients that are in Eastern Kentucky and Western Kentucky. Those are a considerable journey from uh, Northern Kentucky and getting our schedules all together can be a little bit problematic. So we hope to get you into the prisons um, to meet the clients, but again, it's an elective um, aspect of the, court, uh, the course. So um, what is it that you do um, during the semester? Will you review the client's records and you try to determine whether there's the likelihood of turning up new evidence if there's additional investigations? You also, in some cases, get to work with forensic experts. It all depends on what kinds of cases we select and um, what the issues are in, that, in those cases. And you also have the ability, if you want to, to travel around the state with the investigator and participate in investigations. And again, it's depends on your schedule. It depends on our investigator schedule. In the past, um, we have about a third of the students that want to go out and do investigations. Um, we don't ever allow our students to go out and interview witnesses without having an experienced investigator with them. But we have had a couple of cases where people went to old crime scenes and looked over the crime scenes, try to get an idea of like what, what kind of barriers might there be to a visual identification or what kind of lighting there was, or what was the distance between maybe where the, um, the victim was attacked versus where their body was found. 
Um, those are kind of benign investigations where the students can go out by themselves. So um, a lot of students will ask, you know, is, are, are we a guarantee that we're going to get to work on a case where somebody's innocent? Um, not all our cases uh, result in a, even strong evidence or even reasonable evidence that a client is innocent. Our job, though, is to find the ones that are innocent. And so we go through a lot of filtering and reviewing of cases to try to determine, is this a case that we should continue to keep open and continue to investigate to try to develop new evidence? Um, I, I think television does a real disservice to how wrongful convictions generally work. Um, television and podcasts will give you a story. They'll develop the story over a period of months, if not years. And then they'll give you like a 30 or 45 minute summary of everything that happened. And this was the outcome of these investigations. And this went back to court on these issues. And the truth is it takes a lot of time to develop an innocence case. Um, and so the average, if you're looking at the national average of how long it takes to get a case back to court and exonerate somebody, the national average is seven years. So some cases I had a case where I had somebody who I walked out of prison within about 14 months of first opening the case. That is the fastest that I've ever had. I think it's the fastest that our entire unit has ever had. Um, but I've also seen cases where it took 15, 20, and even 30 years to get an exoneration. So it, it's quite a bit of a variable as to what, what kind of cases we get and how long we keep them open for. But our job is to develop claims of wrongful convictions and establish that somebody's innocent and if we need to take it back to court to challenge the conviction. So that's what we do. Um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, a volley, a huge number of exonerations that we had in 2019. Um, we had uh, a, several KIPP clients that were pardoned um, on full and, and unconditional pardons when the governor was leaving office. That was Matt Bevin. And so those four individuals, they were all cases that uh, the Innocence Project and, and at least three of the four cases schools had been working on. Um, and so just a little bit of background, I came into the Kentucky Innocence Project in late 2018, November of 2018. And when I came to the Innocence Project, there were actually no staff that were working there, that, that basically all the staff had left um, between 2017 and 2018. And what we had to go on, we had 1,700 open cases. We had about 20 cases that were being worked by the law schools. And it was only because the law schools had been working the cases and memorializing information, gathering information, that we were able to put clemency packets together in 20, um, 2019 for the then exiting governor um, to review. So, so the moral of the story there is that we had KIPP students, externs that were tracking issues, that were keeping information in front of, um, in front of us so that we could be aware of what cases we should be filing clemency petitions on, and it was only because law students were working cases that the new staff that came in in 2019 were able to write up the clemency petitions. We also had one case that was a reverse and remand in 2019, and that was from um, cases that two U of L students had worked in 2018 and 2019. They were working on it in the 18-19 school year. And we had a pleading that was due. Recall, I just said, I started in November of 2018. So it's new to every one of these cases. And we had a pleading that was due in July of 2019. And it was the law students at UofL that developed the information, did the case review, told me what witnesses I needed to interview. I went out and interviewed witnesses, developed new evidence, and was able to take that case back and meet a critical timeline in July of 2019. Ultimately walked the client out of prison um, and the two students, um, Alexa Elder and Kelly Plan, both helped draft motions that ultimately got the client released. So, you know, they're not just real clients, but we also get real results for our clients. Some cases move faster than others. Um, the the post-trial motion that we took back to court and walked the, prison, uh, the client on, that took us 14 months to develop. But other cases, they, they take considerably longer period of time, but our law students are instrumental in helping us to get evidence developed and also keep issues in front of us and help us determine which cases we're going to keep open and continue to investigate. 
Um, we work as a team. The students work both as team members as externs. So there'll be a team of several externs together on each case. But we also work as a team as the KIPP unit. So myself as the director, um, I have two attorneys that are focused on litigation. We have two paralegals that are helping us with the intake process. And we also have two investigators and everybody comes together um, as a team. I think this is one of the, the most teamwork oriented aspects of legal practice that I have ever seen. You just, you can't do it with an attorney by themselves. You can't do it with just with paralegals or investigators. Everybody's pulling together to develop a case properly so we get back to court. So you're part of a student team, but that student team is also part of a bigger team that works together. And you'll get input, you'll have input with our paralegals um, and with our investigators, and you'll be engaged in dialogues with them about cases as you're developing information from the cases. You'll be getting feedback from us, not only about the work product that you're doing, but also you'll be giving us feedback about the cases, discussing the cases with us. Um, so I just try to sensitize students to the magnitude of wrongful convictions in Kentucky. Um, and so these are the numbers in Kentucky. If you were to consider how many people were in um, a prison type facility in Kentucky, it's around 20,000. It's dropped a little bit um, since those numbers. Those numbers are from 2018. So it's about 20,000 that are in um, some sort of a prison facility, another 20,000 that are in our local jails. There's another 52,000 that are on probation and another 16,000 that are on parole. So if you were to look at the total number of people in Kentucky, it's over 100,000 people that are under some sort of state supervision, under state's custody and control. And thinking in terms of that number, 100,000, the estimates in the research are that between three and 6% of convictions are wrongful convictions. So then you start to do the math on how many people have been wrongfully convicted. So depending on if you say the low number or the high number, 3% or 6%, somewhere between 700 and 1,500 people are in prison who have been wrongfully convicted. And then if you were to look at the total population of people under state's custody and control, that bigger number of 100,000, somewhere between 3,500 and 7,000 people are under the state's custody and control that have been wrongly convicted. So I, I try to help people see that it's a huge problem. It's, it's a more massive problem um, than most people would think because you know everybody thinks that wrongful conviction is that one rare case where everything went wrong. Um, the wrongful convictions that you hear about on podcasts and on TV, in documentaries, uh, those are the stories usually of the people who have, been, who have successfully challenged their conviction. Um, a much larger proportion of people don't have the ability to find the evidence, develop the evidence, or don't, can't access attorneys in order to help them challenge their conviction. Um, so it's a real problem that the KIPP unit is focused specifically on. Um, so the next question is, well, what is it that we'll be doing? Um, well, in general, we assign A and B felonies. Um, we do a, a very occasionally we'll have a C felony. We must never have T, D felony cases that we take just because we're looking for longer sentences because it takes so long to work up a case. Um, so you review a file and it's usually an A or B felony. The file will be extensive. Um, we try our best to choose files that kind of like Goldilocks and the Three Bears. They're not too soft, not too hard, not too big, not too small. They're just the right amount of information um, to be reviewed and considered by the externs. It's not always feasible for us to find the perfect case. Um, in, you know, in the best case scenario, we try to choose a case that has had a trial. We don't really want you watching a three or four week trial because those are so extensive. We try to find a case that's about a, anywhere from a four to six day trial. It's about the right amount of information for students to break down and distill. Um, so it's a fairly extensive file. It's not the biggest out there. It's not like it's a death penalty case, but we don't want you to be watching something that's too succinct because there isn't enough work to do. And what we do is we teach you how to do a thorough and detailed review. And so you're going to learn to do something called bait stamp logging. Um, that's a way that we memorialize the information that you're reviewing as you go through the case file. You learn how to do a video review and to capture just the right amount of detail so you can go back and mine the important information out of the trial. 
Um, hopefully you get to meet the client. Um, the last couple of years has been very problematic. Um, we're a little bit short staffed at times too, so we can't always get students out to the prisons to meet clients. What we will do is assure that if you want to get to a prison and meet a client, if you can't meet the client for your class, we'll get you to a prison with um, one of the other attorneys on a different case visit um, so that you can at least get into a prison and see what it's like for your clients who are in prison. Um, you get to talk to trial and appellate attorneys. Almost all of the cases we review um, have had a trial. So there's a trial attorney who remembers something about the case and they can have a conversation with you about it. If it's had a trial, it's probably had lots of objections and there's probably an appellate case out there that you can also review. So you'll talk to the appellate attorneys and you'll also um, review the appellate briefs and the, um, the opinions that the Court of Appeals or the Supreme Court issued on the cases. So you get a really nice, expansive flavor of what happens in criminal defense cases. Um, we're focused on what's called post-conviction work. We're looking at ineffective assistance of counsel claims and uh, motions for, under new evidence claims. That's specifically what KIPP does. But you'll get to see all the other pieces of the trial and the other aspect of appellate work um, because most of these cases have been appealed. So it's really a nice broad range of criminal defense issues that you get to look at. Um, so in your specific case, you'll also be developing an investigative plan. If there's investigations that need to be done, you'll be talking with the investigator about what might be feasible. If you wanna be a part of those investigations and you can take the time to go with the investigator, you can go on those investigations with them. Um, and then at the end of the two semesters, you write a final memo with recommendations. And that's actually a really big part of memorializing everything you've done in the file. We take, we take teaching students about how to close a case very seriously because students go to law school and they learn how to do legal analysis, but they don't necessarily think about how is it that I'm managing a file once I have a file. And closing how you close a file is just as critical as how you open a file and how you work a case. Um, it's a two semester commitment. We run fall and spring. Um, it's two semester commitment because it takes us all that time to teach you everything. And so the beginning of the semester, the beginning of the fall semester starts with an actual boot camp day. It's the Friday, either the Friday of the first week of classes, or if people have conflicts, we may push that up and have you meet the Friday before classes were up, uh, classes start. Um, so we do that from nine to three, from about nine, we block time from nine to four. We generally wrap up around three or 3.30. We feed you lunch. Um, there's a lot of stuff that goes on during the onboarding process. And we call it a boot camp or an immersion class because there's so much to absorb about what it is you're gonna be doing throughout the semester. And if we don't do everything together all at once in six hours, we're spending a whole month of class just trying to get you up and running to the point where we can hand a case to you. And so we want to give you your cases within the first three weeks of class. In order to do that, we've got to do an immersion day and get you ready to handle that case so that you're understanding different aspects of the case. And it's a two semester course because really the first semester, you're just going to be getting to understand the, the factual and the legal issues in your case. And you can't really even start developing an investigative plan or re refining how you're processing the legal issues or what you might be able to do for next steps on the case until the second semester. So there's just no way to do a significant innocence case in less than two semesters time, particularly thinking about the amount of time it takes to onboard you and then also to teach you about how, how investigations are run um, and all the different forensic issues and substantive issues that are related to wrongful conviction work. Um, let's see. Uh, okay, so there's a couple of um, interesting events that go on during the two semesters. Um, in October, we'll do what's called CSI Day, and it's a full day event. It's on a Friday, so you shouldn't have any conflicts with other classes. And at CSI Day, we run this at a farm in Frankfurt. So you, everybody will come down to Frankfurt. We start CSI Day about 9.45 in the morning. And you walk through a mock crime scene. And so there's various stations around the, the farm. And you get to spend 15 to 20 minutes at each station reviewing and observing potential evidence. 
Um, so then after we do the morning session, we head out to another location at noon and we have lunch. And then in the afternoon, you get to interview witnesses that may or may not have information about the potential crime. And then after you've done about two, two and a half hours of interviewing witnesses, the students get together in teams and they develop a theory, an alternative theory um, as to who, who might have engaged in the crime. Um, we had during CSI day, we have somebody who the police have picked up and you, you watch a, a attorney do a mock interview of the person who's the police suspect. And your job is to develop a theory that involves an alternative perpetrator. That's a really fun event. Students really like it. Um, it's a very much a hands-on thinking about what kind of evidence has been collected and also gives you a chance to, to dip your toe into interviewing witnesses, um, whether they may be friendly witnesses or hostile witnesses. There's a whole variety of witnesses that play the roles and that the students get to interview. Um, in the spring semester, we haven't done it the last two years because of COVID, but I'm very optimistic that next year in 2023, in January or early February, we will do our lab day at the Kentucky State Police Laboratory. Um, and so there you do a two hour tour and one of the lab, one of the senior um, analysts at the laboratory walks you around, they show you the evidence room where they store evidence, they talk to you about how they log evidence in, and then they take you to the different departments which do forensic analysis. So you'll, you'll go to the ballistics lab, um, you'll go to the seriology lab, you'll go to the fingerprinting lab, uh, you'll go to the uh, DNA, DNA analysis lab, and you get to talk to some of the analysts, you get to watch them do what they do. Um, I think for students, it's really meaningful. It kind of solidifies what's happening in a criminal defense case that they're working on when they're getting all these lab results. I think it just makes everything that much more real. And then the end of the spring semester, and we usually do this around mid to late March, we do what we call our evening with exonerees event. Haven't been able to do that the last couple of years, but again, we're optimistic that we'll be able to do it in 2023. We bring uh, a, about somewhere usually between six and 10 of Kentucky's exonerees will come back to Frankfurt and we'll have dinner with them and we'll have them do a presentation, kind of a Q&A type of presentation where they're telling the students about their story and what happened and what life was like in prison, what it was like to be going through this wrongful conviction claim, what life was like when they were released. Um, and it's a great capstone because it makes everything very, very real for you. Um, so we are hoping to be able to do that um, again in March of 2023, um, as long as this whole pandemic thing just starts to go away and bring our lives back to normal. Um, we do expect work product. And I tell students, this is not a passive experience. Um, we are working real cases. We need you to be able to work together as a team and develop product. We show you how to do the product. I give a lot of feedback to students as to, okay, you can have a little more detail here. I'm trying to understand what you're saying here. Um, you might want to communicate differently in this, in this um, letter to your client. I, I, there's just a lot of um, product that's delivered to us. And then we return with feedback, at least when the initial product is sent to us. We do something called bait stamp logging. It's a little tedious, but it's the best way to memorialize information. And I think it's a great skill to have. Many law firms use it. Um, I know that all, I can't imagine there's a death penalty litigator out there that doesn't use bait stamping if they're doing post-conviction work. Um, and we really try to drive home the concept of how to develop working summaries from files because as an attorney, you are going to be handling files with massive amounts of information, and you've got to be able to go back and retrieve that information. So we have a system that we teach the students, which I think is helpful when they go into practice. Um, you'll generate investigative reports if you're involved in investigations or investigative requests, and you'll also be doing updates to those through the semester. Um, we also have the students do a closing memo to file. We teach you about what should be in a memo when you're writing a, a memo regarding a file review and how to have a, a useful document developed for successor counsel. Um, and then each law school fluctuates a little bit as far as what the individual law school requirements are. At NKU, 
you will do a mid-semester reflection and a final um, end of semester reflection that prompts you to think about things re related to um, what you're learning and how it relates to the practice of law. Um, so those are also due. We have work product turned in. Work product and hours are due to me on the 1st and the 15th of every month. Um, and so that we can be reviewing the work product that you're generating, any work product that you update, you resubmit to me. And then we're watching your hours to make sure you're getting the right amount of hours in and that you're focusing on the right types of projects. Um, just in general, the kinds of issues that we work on, um, if you were to, to think broadly in terms of the reasons for wrongful convictions, um, we usually have cases that will either and possibly have additional, you know, multiple issues on, in it. Um, we can have cases that involve government misconduct. We can have cases that involves misinformation by a witness or an informant might be a jailhouse informant, or it might be an informant that's been incentivized, maybe a confidential informant that's receiving money. Um, some cases have issues revolving around invalid forensic science. There's been a tremendous amount of change in the um, validity, or there's been questions about the validity of various forensic science that has been used over the last 20 to 30 years. So some of, sometimes we'll take a case just because we want to take a look at what actual tests were used and have those tests changed, um, what's the current standard. And then some cases involve an adequate defense, what would be known as ineffective assistance of counsel. On a lot of these cases, it's kind of like a perfect storm. Um, and, you know, wrongful conviction is much more likely to happen if one of these issues exists or these issues compound each other because there's multiple, multiple issues existing. And government misconduct also is broken down into a couple of different areas. Um, you know, sometimes it's an informant that's been induced to make a false statement. Sometimes it's coercive confessions. Um, I have a wonderful videotape about the read technique. And that re the read technique is the standard that is taught in police academies. Um, you can go for a three-day weekend and get certified in the read technique. And it's a nine-step process that basically is highly coercive um, and is, you know, has a likelihood of uh, eliciting a false confession. It's great because you can pressure somebody who might not confess using the read technique, but you also wind up with a certain amount of false confessions. Um, we talk about um, information that's withheld through discovery. There's a lot of general talk about how discovery works and why discovery is so important in preparing for a criminal defense case, actually any case that's going back, back to court, whether it's criminal, whether it's civil, um, the basis of what you're doing in court is going to rely completely on how you go through your discovery practice. So there's at least you know, some sense of, okay, this is how discovery works. And this is how I can assure that all my discovery requests actually have been complied with. You know, you're always looking for those missing gaps in discovery to try to determine did the government withhold something. Um, and we also talk about misidentification. We have a whole, a, a one, one and a half hour lecture on misidentification and why people might may identify the wrong person due to a leading photo pack or a leading lineup or show up and what those methods are and how to assure um, that you have a reliable identification and what are the best practices in using those types of identification techniques. Um, the issue of forensic science, we're gonna have you at the very beginning of the semester, at least do a very quick review of um, two reports, one from 2008 and one from 2016 that explain all the problems with past science, the forensic sciences that have were routinely relied upon in the 1980s, 90s, and early 2000s, and even sometimes now. Like shaken baby is actually a really hot issue. I'd say um, about 50% of the wrongful conviction filings nationally are coming out of the shaken baby science right now. So there's uh, there's experts out there that say that the symptoms that were previously associated with shaken baby that experts would say, you know, without a shadow of a doubt, you could conclude that this was a baby that had been shaken, that those symptoms are now have, have been determined to be unreliable. Um, so, so we're looking at these forensic sciences and the um, PCAST, it's called the PCAST 
report um, and the National Academy of Science reports, and just at least understanding to some extent uh, how, you know, what kind of forensic issues may exist and what to be looking for in future cases. Um, and so this just gives you an idea of where the different prisons are located on in Kentucky. Um, and some of our past clients, is, uh, clients. Um, if you take a look at like this, this group up here, um, there's a complex up in LaGrange that is three prisons. And there's also uh, the women's, in, whoops, sorry about that. The women's institute that's uh, in Louisville. Um, these are ones that are fairly easy to, for you guys to get to. And so if we can get you down to the prisons to see what they're like and kind of get a feel and a flavor for that, um, we will. And you're certainly welcome to go to any of the prisons with us when we're making a client visit that's further out in Kentucky. Uh, it's just, you know, you have to recognize that you guys have classes and other outside commitments. And um, these are usually a 10 to 12 hour trip. Um, and so this kind of gives you an idea of how the semester rolls out. Um, we start on the left hand side, um, basically doing uh, the initial orientation. We do that one day orientation and then we start, if you look at the very top, we start teaching you about how the intake process works. And then we assign the cases to you um, and you, we deliver those cases through Google Drive and you have access to them. And then you start doing your review. And so then, you know, by September, you've got your cases and you're starting to do the work. In August, you've, you're probably only gonna work on some intakes and take a look at how those intakes work. We, um, we may give you intakes throughout the semester just to kind of keep you fresh, looking at different cases and asking you to do those assessments. Um, in October, we do CSI day. And then down here, like this is the experiential part of the course. Down here is like the teaching content that we're trying to explain to you and have you thinking about, and you know, how does this relate to your case? How might this relate to your practice? Um, so we'd look at things like, you know, what are wrongful convictions? We'd start out talking about just wrongful convictions in general, and then we'll talk about how investigations work. And then we'll talk about things like ineffective assistance of counsel. Um, as we go into the second semester, we'll get a little bit heavier into um, things like witness misidentification, um, forensic science, government misconduct. So, so at the top of the screen, you see these are more of the experiential aspects of the course. The bottom is more of the substantive material that we're trying to teach. We get together and we meet on Fridays for two hours. Um, usually about an hour of that is kind of like a lecture where I'm talking about PowerPoints and we're having a little bit of class discussion. The other hour is generally about what are we doing on our cases, um, more of a skills-based aspect. We might have you do some sort of a mock interview or a mock exercise to help you understand what it is that you should be doing when you're working on your cases. And then um, up here in red, we've got the Kentucky Lab Tour that usually happens sometime between mid-January and early February. And then up here we have Exoneree Day. So that's how the two semesters rolls out. Um, so I wanna talk about um, one of our exonerees from 2019, just to give you a little context of the reality of all this. Um, Delmar Parton was 63 years old, He'd spent 27 years in prison. Um, we were reopening his case under a grant that we got from the federal government to reassess DNA cases. And we had reason to believe that there was some evidence that remained that had never been DNA tested. And we wanted to do DNA testing on it. Um, we, we identified the case in 2018 when I came in. In 2019, we, we, had, we weren't quite ready to start working the case up, but we it's definitely hanging out there as, as something that we wanted to move forward on. In 2019, we got this award, a, a substantial award um, for DNA testing. And that would allow me to assign a specific attorney to this case and have funds for testing. And so we started that grant in January of 2020. We were able to access funds. So we were all kind of primed and ready to start working um, this case. And he wasn't actually the strongest case. I had one case that I felt was a stronger DNA case, but I put this case first in line because he's 63 years old. And I thought if I don't move fast on this case, this guy is gonna die in prison. Um, he had a life sentence and he could have been paroled except he maintained his innocence. And by the time he met the parole board for a second time on the second parole board meeting, when he said, 
I'm maintaining my innocence. They said, we're not even going to consider you for parole anymore. He was an exemplary prisoner, 27 years in prison. He had a stellar record. Um, very unusual for Department of Corrections people to write letters of recommendations for anyone. They generally won't do that, but he was such a good guy. He, Del Mar, was able to get a couple of um, letters written for him. So I really felt very, very strongly that he was one of the most important cases um, because of his age. I wanted to move fast on it. However, right before we got access to the funding, um, we also submitted a clemency packet to him and Matt Bevan was leaving, leaving office um, in December of 2019. And lo and behold, Del Mar was granted a pardon. Now, this is something that we actually do have our students work on alongside of an innocence case. We also have them working on clemency petitions, what we call alternative relief, which could be either a clemency petition or parole packet. And um, it also helps get you ready to do alternative sentencing plans for clients if you're doing trial level work. So to create some reality and some context, this is Del Mar as he's walking out of the prison. He's 63 years old and he's walking out into the world with everything he owns that's stored in three garbage bags. Um, and so we were there to meet him. That's actually Whitney Wallace on the left. She helps assist with the NKU teaching and Chrissy Majar on the right, they're meeting Del Mar as he walks out of prison. And um, Chrissy actually teaches the uh, wrongful conviction course at the University of Kentucky down in um, Lexington. And so, and this is Del Mar and his dog Dolly, and he's living down in Florida with his cousin, and he has his life back. He's been out now for, what is it, three, three and a half years. Um, he writes to us every holiday. He sends me texts. He checks in with us um, and the level of gratitude from this person is just overwhelming. And I just want to say that is something that you will get a sense of if you have the opportunity to go out and meet clients. They are so incredibly grateful for the work that we do. Um, and so I want to go back to this idea that, you know, it can be really hard to develop an innocence case. And we go through hundreds, hundreds of cases before we find one where we can develop the evidence and take it back to court. And I think some people say, you know, isn't that disheartening? And it's like, I think about people like Del Mar. Um, I just had one of my clients' moms write to me two weeks ago. And literally she said, you know, he's doing really well. Um, I wanted to let you know, thank you for everything you did. And thank you for giving him his life back. And that's literally, literally, I feel like I'm saving someone's life and I'm giving them back to their families as well. Um, so that's why we do it. And then, so just my ending image is here. Um, this is William Virgil, um, hugging his KIPP attorney, Linda Smith, as his case draws to a conclusion. Um, the sad note here, I mean, this is just a very heartwarming photo. The sad note is that, um, Mr. Virgil passed away almost exactly on his five-year anniversary date of release. Um, prison is a hard life. And, you know, 10 or 20 years in prison as, as an older individual um, doesn't, doesn't guarantee that you're going to be in very good health or sets you up for very bad health. Um, but I also look at the flip side, which is I gave him or Kip gave him five years of his life back that he wouldn't have had. So, so that's my talk. That's my, um, that's my pitch for the Kentucky Innocence Project. Um, something that I think is critical, critical to understand is this, this, Course is work. <laughs> it is work, and I will not let you skate on the work. If you feel like you can dig in and you can make it happen, I feel like I can teach you a lot, not only about wrongful convictions, but how it is that you manage files and what you should be thinking about as a practicing attorney and how to rise to the difficulties of um, very problematic challenges in some of these cases. But if you want to be passive, and if you don't want to do the work, or if you're a student that says, I'm going to get, you know, the, the Cali notes, the Barbary notes, I'm going to review everything, I'm going to cram like crazy at the end of the semester, I know I can pull out a C plus or a B, um, this is not a course for you, because you have to be working the case every step of the way, you have to be willing to put in eight to 10 hours every week, and stay focused, and eight to 10 hours means eight to 10 hours of real work where you're actually developing product and getting to understand your case. Um, it's, not the, it's not the course that you say, I'm gonna make it all up at the end. I'm gonna pull it, I'm gonna pull it all night or I'm gonna pull it all weaker. 
I'm going to cram hard and work hard the last two or three weeks of the semester um, because you will never get the work product done. And your teammates are also going to be relying on you to keep up with the work because you're going to be working with your team, your fellow externs. You're also going to be working with the team members that are in KIPP. And we expect that you're going to be working the case and keeping up with the work product. Um, so with that said, if I haven't scared you away, I'm happy to answer questions. Um, I have a question. Just wondering, like, what the application process is. Like, how do we sign up? Yes, great question. What I require is a resume. Um, the resume should have your GPA on it, or give me, tell me what your GPA is. Um, and I also ask for a letter of intent. And then we go through an interview process, which usually occurs um, sometime between April 15th and June 15th is kind of the average time range. Um, I'll, I, I'm gonna be out at a conference um, until the middle of April, but if people get their applications to Professor Mannheimer, when I get back from the conference, I'll start you know, looking at schedules saying, okay, when can you interview? I, I usually plan on about an hour long interview. It usually takes about 45 minutes. Um, and it is a process so that you and I can assure that we really are a good fit for each other. And the reason is it's, you know, it's a two semester commitment. I don't want you in a course that isn't a good fit for you. And I, I have never had to decline anybody and say you're not in, but anybody who has been on my decline list has come back to me within a few days and said, I'm withdrawing my application. I don't think it's a good fit. So it's just us making sure we're a good fit for each other, because I do feel like, um, you know, you're working for real clients. We're asking a lot of you. If you can't really commit yourself to this course, then don't, don't start it. And people come to Innocence Work sometimes because they think it's cool and it's sexy. And I've seen, I've literally seen people who want, want the KIPP externship on their resume and they want to tell their friends I'm working on KIPP cases. And when I explain to them, like you really got to wrap your brain around the fact that you're, you may be working on a case that either the person we ultimately clue, conclude they're not innocent or we can't prove that they're innocent and it's gonna be a lot of work, then this isn't the place for you. Other thoughts? Um, my question is, is there, or do you have a preference on whether you prefer two L's over three L's? That is like, that question comes up all the time. So I'm glad you, you asked it. It's better for you to ask it, me to answer it than for me to tell you. Three L's wind up with senioritis and it can be tough. And I'm not happy about people at the end of the semester who are just kind of letting off the throttle and saying, I'm gonna pass everything, it doesn't matter. We have work to do, we've got to continue the work. I find that my two L's are just as good as my three L's. Um, I think my two L, the two L's have been through that, that indoctrination process of that first year and you're done with that, you know, like you've, you've gotten far enough in that you're saying, okay, I wanna really find out why I wanna be a lawyer. And this gives you that chance. Um, so I really feel like the two L's do just as well as the three L's overall. Um, I think there's a, like a slightly higher level of enthusiasm with the two L's because it's like, this is why I came to law school and now I get to do it. Um, and then, the only caveat I have is that there's a lot of stuff offered to two L's. And if there's, you really have to prioritize. Um, you can get pulled in so many different directions. And in general, when I see a lackluster performance, it's because people have got too many things on their plate. And so be sure this is something you wanna invest your time and your energy in and that there aren't too many other things that are competing for your time because you're gonna to have to put time into this class. This might be a question more so for Professor Mannheimer. I know the Innocence Project is listed on NKU's course catalog with the prerequisite of evidence. Is that something we can do concurrently? Cause I know I'll be taking evidence next fall and I'm still interested in doing this. I just didn't know if that was an automatic kicker. Yeah, I think that's probably outdated because um, evidence is, is 
Yeah, because if, you, if you're a 2L, you will not have taken evidence yet, um, unless we offer it over the summer, and we usually don't. Uh, so yeah, it's fine if you're taking it at the same time, because I think you have to take it uh, first semester, or second year if you're full time. So yeah, don't worry about that. I, I don't see evidence as a necessary prerequisite, and I see some value in taking evidence at the same time because we will probably talk about very, like there'll, there'll be some symmetry in some of our discussions with what your evidence class is teaching. And I think you'll get it on a, on a deeper level if you're hearing these things at the same time versus, oh, you heard them last year and now it's like, oh yeah, I remember that vaguely. So don't worry about it. Um, I think it actually strengthens the experience for you. Okay. Thank you all. While we're on some of the Chase specific details, let me, because I'm, I don't think Suzanne mentioned this, but it's um, two credits per semester. Um, Suzanne did mention it's a full year commitment. So two credits in the, two credits in the spring. And with those two credits comes a requirement of 100 hours of work per semester that includes class time. So if there's about 20 hours of class time per semester, then there's about 80, 80 hours of other work outside the classroom work because this is a clinic class, uh, slash externship, whatever, whatever you want to call it. Um, but um, you, know, you shouldn't have a problem doing those 80 other hours given all, all the work that there is in, in, uh, in reviewing these cases. And, uh, so um, I'm trying to think if there's anything, let me take a look at my, my crib notes here. <clears throat> if there's anything else I want to say. Uh, the, um, oh, the, the other thing that might affect part-time students is that you have to have completed at least 28, hour, uh, 28 credit hours to do KIPP or I think really any clinic or externship. I think that's our rule on clinics and externships. So 28 hours, which if you're a full-time student, shouldn't be a problem by the beginning of the year. If you're a part-time student, it might be a problem. Um, and then the other thing that I wanted to mention was the application process Suzanne mentioned. Um, we'll, we'll put that stuff up on the Chase website under uh, what is the heading I think it's I think it's under clinical programs so we'll put that up on the Chase website um, fairly soon I don't know when registration is um, and obviously wh whenever it is it's coming up soon wh when you do your registration you're not going to know if you will have been accepted to KIPP so just do your registration as if you're not taking KIPP and then you can you can you know we'll add you later and you'll probably have to drop a class. Yeah, and I'll try to do those um, interviews as soon as possible. I mean, because I know students who are like, if I don't get in here, then I got to figure out where I'm going. And so I do try to get you all in ASAP. Um, and usually, you know, we both know whether we're a good fit for each other towards the end of the interview. So hopefully, you know, we, we have a meeting of the minds on that. And I do suggest getting your like getting your applications in sooner because we are we do tend to fill up. Um, and you know if we have six to eight slots and we're full, and you you know you apply late, we're you're not going to be able to get in. We can't give you a spot. We we are very. Um, I found that this. For me, the best number to have in the class is six, but I know that this law school schools would prefer that we bring in eight, so we're willing to do that. Yeah, so it's April 1st already, so we'll have something up on the Chase website. Um, check back next week, and there should be something up there <clears throat> on the application process. Um, so it's, it's one o'clock. I don't want to keep Suzanne any longer. Um, I, if you have any other questions, um just sh shoot me an email if i can't answer it i'll just forward it over to suzanne and she can answer it all right okay nice seeing you all thanks for coming nice to meet you. You. look yes, forward to having an uh, interview you have a good weekend bye. okay bye. take care thanks